Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm always nervous when I'm introduced in Alabama. Uh, for good reason. Um, back when I was uh, the founding director of the Alabama Civil Liberties Union, I was introduced here in Montgomery by someone who said that my service to the state was invaluable. That every morning he got up and looked to see if there was an indication of a, a lawsuit that the ACLU had filed or a public statement I had made so that he would know what the right position on an issue was. Because he knew if I took that position, it was the wrong position. <laughs> and then, of course, when I got into scholarship, um, I was, uh, I sparred with a, uh, uh, more than one scholar about in Southern history and its interpretation and trends. And uh, one of those uh, scholars introduced me at a conference and said that Steve Suits has an incredible mind. He said he can remember anything, whether it happened or not. <laughs> So I was, uh, I appreciated very much that introduction, especially uh, it, that it had no punchline at the end. Uh, hopefully today's um, talk will um, allow you to give some dissent to those two views of what I have to say. Alabama has provided the symbolic bookends of our national struggle with race relations, and racism over the last 150 years. Only a few feet from this spot stands the White House of the Confederacy. And a little further away, but not too far, is the star of Jefferson Davis, where he stood and took the oath of office on the veranda of our state capitol in order to be president of a Confederate slave society. But a little further on down the street is the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King Jr. became the national leader of the modern civil rights movement. And a little further on down is the Southern Poverty Law Center's monument to those who died in the conflicts over the modern civil rights movement, and the Rosa Parks Museum, commemorating her pivotal role in the Montgomery bus boycott, which in many ways catapulted the modern civil rights movement. Recently, another museum and monument have been added to Montgomery's public landscape by the Equal Justice Initiative. Additions to the state's public symbols reveal the worst aspects of our national life and struggles with race relations and racism that fall between those two symbolic bookends between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. These new public spaces, in my judgment, represent a deeply moving tribute to both those African Americans and those who fell victim to Southern lynchings and the Southern tragic criminal justice system, and to remind us of the aspects of those systems that persist today. One white person who lived across most of that period from the aftermath of the Civil War to the modern Civil Rights Movement was Hugo Black of Alabama. He was born in 1886, only 10, day, only 10 years after the end of Reconstruction, and he died in 1971, three years after the murder of Martin Luther King, Jr. During Black's lifetime, white Southern society tolerated and at moments celebrated lawless vigilantism that resulted in more than 4,000 lynchings and the legalized murder of thousands of more through the use of a criminal justice system that was governed by raw, ruthless white supremacy. During the years Hugo Black came of age, practiced law, and represented this state in the United States Senate, there were almost 370 lynchings in Alabama. Today, I want to review the life and times of Hugo Black of Alabama within this explicit context. 
within this raw history of brutal, murderous racial exploitation. Black story in dealing with the Jim Crow criminal justice system of Alabama does not alter this history. But I hope it can reveal a more complex past than both black and white Alabamians know commonly. There were no lynchings in the area of Alabama when Hugo Black came of age. After the Civil War, but before Black was born, two had been lynched in Clay County, Alabama, where he grew up, one an African-American and one a white. In the 1890s of Clay County, young Hugo Black was in a rural, isolated place where the courthouse was both the venue for the trial of right and wrong and also for the conflict of political ideas between conservative Democrats and the emerging populist. Alabama populism was not a simple movement, but at bottom it represented the first challenge of poor whites against reestablishing a southern way of life that was on the same terms as the life of Alabama before the Civil War. The populist rallying cry came from a paraphrase of Thomas Jefferson, equal justice to all and special privilege to none a phrase young Hugo Black heard often on the steps of the Clay County Courthouse. Black moved in 1907 to Birmingham after attending law school in Tuscaloosa. In 1907, he was 21 and had a law degree. 1907 was the year that brought the takeover of Birmingham industry by U.S. Steel, officially marking the point in which Birmingham became a part of the colonial economy of the South. And one year later, Birmingham endured a miners' strike by virtually the only interracial organization that existed in Alabama at that time, the United Mine Workers, the UMW. More than 7,000 UMW miners left the mines around Birmingham, and in response, the mining companies and the Jefferson County Sheriff amassed an army of private guards and armed deputies paid by the mining companies themselves. The coal operators evicted the mining families from the company-owned towns where the families lived, and the union had to rent farmlands to set up tents for the evicted strikers and their families. The UMW described it as a reign of terror where the sheriff's deputies and private guards were breaking up meetings, taking men by force, and using violent tactics in order to prompt a violent response. Attorney Black was enlisted to assist these miners and their families shortly before Alabama's governor called out state troops to prevent any assembly in the, near the mines, to stop all marching along the public highways near the mines, and to disperse any gathering where a soldier thought it might incite alarm. He also threatened to permit citizens of the state to form posses comitatus to protect the mines and to keep the mining fields quiet. Later, Alabama Governor B.B. Comer ordered state troops to destroy the miners' tent city on private property and to root their families away in order, in his words, to preserve public health. In truth, the governor's concern for public health had nothing to do with physical sanitation. As the governor said, you know what it means to have eight or 9,000 niggers idle in the state of Alabama? I'm not going to stand for it. And he did not. The failed strike left many black and white miners blacklisted, barred from working ever again in Alabama mines. As unemployed, these miners were now subject to arrest for loitering or vagrancy in the Birmingham's Old South system of law and order. For in 1909, every arrest of an African American in Birmingham generated income for either the county sheriff, the county deputies, the justice of the peace, or the court clerk, or all of them all who were paid on the basis of the number of people who were accused, arrested, jailed, or tried for a crime. This fee system 
provided local government officials with revenues in place of taxes for their salaries and supplied labor-hungry mining companies with forced cheap labor. And in this case, of the former miners, cheap skilled labor. It was a merger of racism, industrial profit, and self-serving white government. After the miners' strike, Black became a part-time reformist city judge, meeting out misdemeanor punishments in a tough, sometimes paternalistic, but often even-handed way. Black was appointed as a part-time judge to take the place of three full-time judges, whose public service had been financed by the fee system. Black's judgeship, which lasted about 18 months, was a test as to whether or not the city courts of Birmingham could operate fairly, efficiently, without the fee system. And Judge Black had helped to prove that Birmingham could, even if Jefferson County would not. In his private practice, Hugo Black primarily represented black and white workers, often those in the mines and in industries injured on the job. In cases involving African Americans who were his clients, Black took the law and the all-white juries as he found them. He and his black clients did not try to preach to the all-male, all-white jurors equal justice, although those were the goals they sought. Black and his clients tried to help the jurors understand how injustices and injuries to African Americans in the mines jeopardized white miners and the white community as well. It is a testament to Hugo Black's talents as a lawyer that he often, not always, but often succeeded. for county And on a promise of law and order. As prosecutor for approximately two and a half years, County Solicitor Black was much more concerned about the misdeeds of the powerful than of the weak. This concern led him to dismiss almost 4,000 cases, pending cases, mostly related to prohibition, gaming, and shooting crafts, throwing dice. Virtually all 4,000 dismissals were African-American defendants. By removing such large numbers of prisoners from Jefferson County jails and from the court system, Black attempted to close down the fee system of Jefferson County. And for his efforts, he was accused by white deputies and others of freeing, and I quote them, dangerous, murderous Negroes while jailing innocent, harmless white men. Black also led a grand jury to investigate the police practices of Bessemer, Alabama, the industrial black belt of Alabama. The grand jury report which Black wrote, found that white police officers routinely beat African-American suspects who spiked leather straps and used them to produce confessions of crimes that the suspects often did not commit. Black wrote that the police officers had violated their solemn duty of, in his words, protecting the weak, unfortunate, humble, as well as the rich and the powerful. Black's report did not mention the race of his victims, although everyone knew. Birmingham's black newspaper at that time had this headline on reading and reporting on the Negro should have done. Black, the prosecutor, aggress aggressively enforced the state's new prohibition laws, something he did with gusto as the son of an alcoholic father. But he did so by spending most of his energy trying to prosecute the white men who, in Black's view, profited from putting people in the gutters by the sale and distribution of whiskey and the spread of professional gambling. In a county where white supremacy meant that white was always right, Black went after white men who enriched themselves by manufacturing crimes in the black and white communities. In the two years before Black became county prosecutor, Jefferson County endured the lynching of three African Americans. In 1913, one was lynched for showing disrespect to a white woman and her family. In 1916, a young African American man in Jefferson 
was accused by a white woman of raping her during Black's term. She made a positive identification in the grand jury room. Black unusually called African Americans to testify to the grand jury, and they, many of those testified that they saw the accused elsewhere that day. When word spread throughout Inslee, armed white men congregated near the jail and threatened to lynch this young 17-year-old African-American accused of rape. In response, Black took several steps to avoid that possibility. And after the 17-year-old escaped the death penalty in a trial, Black secretly transported the prisoner in a baggage car to safety. Black's conduct left many in Ansley's white community seething with anger and outrage that the African-American man whom a white woman had accused of rape would not be put to death through his prosecution or through his allowing a mob to do it. After serving stateside during World War I, Black resumed his private practice representing many of the same type of clients, laborers who had suffered an injury in the company town run by industrialists, Birmingham, Alabama. He also became the attorney for several unions, again, including the United Mine Workers, who had rebuilt their membership in Alabama due to the federal oversight of the mines during World War I. After the war in 1921, Mine operators refused to bargain in any way with the UMW, and the union reluctantly called a strike. The industrialists blamed the walkout on the fact that, and I quote, 80% of the union members were Negroes, easily led, misled by a few whites and Yankeeized <coughs> Negro agitators. Once again, Alabama's governor dispatched state troopers to join company paid deputies and guards. Coal operators evicted all the union workers and their families from the company-owned homes. Soldiers stopped all meetings in the area. In a sweeping challenge, Hugo Black filed a suit in state court on behalf of the United Mine Workers, alleging the state was violating their rights and their civil liberties, rights guaranteed, he argued, guaranteed by the state and federal constitutions. But Alabama's mine managers and industrialists spread the word that UMW had black men presiding at meetings where the, and I quote, the Negro man is sitting next to a white woman. A coal mine operator also proclaimed in public, and I quote, several of our men tell me that the union promised black miners equal votes and equal marriage laws. The union responded. The United Mine Workers are not preaching social equality, insisted the president of the UMW, but preaching industrial equality. Let us have equal justice for all, he pleaded. The reply was too little, too late. For the second time in 15 years, a strike by black and white miners failed because the state prevented them from assembling, from organizing, from speaking about their grievances while mine owners and mine operators were free to assemble and speak publicly to the deep-seated fears that an interracial union ignited among the white population of Alabama in 1922. During the strike, three white men were killed, one state soldier and two miners. One of the miners, one, the one who accused of shooting the state trooper, was lynched in nearby Walker County. He was taken from a jail by a gang of nine men, and afterwards his body was found on a roadside riddled with bullets. The nine men were later discovered as soldiers who had been brought to Birmingham to preserve law and order. Their defense at trial relied on the fact that the lynched white man served under the supervision of an African-American vice president of the UNW. The soldiers were never punished for their crime. With the defeat of the UMW in Birmingham in 1922, Alabama would not see again for over 30 years the existence of an interracial membership-based organization. It was the end of interracial relations of any positive sort. 
The only mines that fully operated during the UMW strike were those that were worked exclusively by forced convict labor, uh, mostly African Americans leased to the mines by the state in nearby counties. More than any other aspect of the New South, convict leasing in Alabama came closest to reinventing slavery. The leasing of thousands of convicts, almost all African Americans, primarily to mines and mine operators around Birmingham, remained the worst example of the enduring Old South traditions. In 1919, a state legislative committee called Convict Leasing Alabama's Unique Form of Human Slavery and condemned leasing as a legalized murder since the life expectancy of a leased convict in the Alabama mines was less than seven years. In truth, Alabama's state government had become addicted to convict revenues. The convict department generated 20% of the state's gross revenues in 1920. 20% of all revenues. It had become the state's largest single source of income. The state's financial dependency on deadly, forced black labor now created as much resistance to the changing and ending of the system as did the coal company's hunger for private profit. After the miners' strike, Hugo Black of Alabama became the leader in and outside of the court in fighting to end Alabama's convict leasing system. In 1921, the Alabama Supreme Court ruled against one of Black's clients, a man, a black man evocatively named John Brown, a convict injured in the local mines. The Alabama's highest court ruled that black, Brown, Black's client, was essentially a dead man within the eyes of the law and like his slave ancestors, was now denied by law the right to appear in court to testify in a case concerning his own injuries and causes. John Brown and many others in the convict lease system after this opinion, almost all African American men, were civilly dead. Although John Brown has been hired by the state to the Montevallo Mining Company, Black had argued to the court, he has not ceased to be a human being and a person. The court's opinion disagreed and returned Alabama law to the Old South ethics of enslaving human beings by permanently stripping them of the rights of legal existence in a court of law. Another least convict, who also was Black's client, had also been injured in the Montevallo mines when a roof collapsed and Henry Lewis's leg and foot were crushed. Black had represented him and dozens of others in that mining accident against the, uh, the owners of the Montevallo Mining who attempted to go into bankruptcy court in order to discharge any judgments against them. Those judgments were judgments that Black had sought in the federal courts since the state courts had been blocked. So Black took this case to the United States Supreme Court. It's the only case that Justice Black, that Hugo Black ever argued as a lawyer before the U.S. Supreme Court, and he won. During this time, a convict riot broke out in the Montevallo mines. More than 65 convicts entombed themselves beneath the earth by dynamiting the entrances to the mine and dynamiting the heavy equipment to ensure a blockade. And when the armed guards attempted to rush them, they threw dynamite at the guards, trying to deter them. Former Jefferson County solicitor Hugo Black rushed from Birmingham to represent these convict miners. Against new charges of attempted murder, Black was prepared to defend these African-American men. Everyone knew that the convicts had helped destroy what today would be about $4.5 million of, of the mine owner's equipment, had thrown dynamite at company's white guards, and it endangered the lives of others. In Black's view, however, these African-American convicts had been driven to lawless violence by official lawlessness, by the government's decision to place them outside the law, to deny them any lawful protection or remedy against violence. Before an all-white jury and a full trial, Black volunteered 
to defend this mob violence and lawlessness as justifiable. It was the single instance in all of Hugo Black's life where there is any reliable record showing that he stood up to speak or to act on behalf or in defense of group violence. It was during this time that Black became the president of the Alabama Prison Reform Association, a group started by the Alabama League of Women Voters to build popular support to put an end to the convict leasing system. It was the state's primary civic group fighting against convict leasing. It was also during this time, in the fall of 1923, that Hugo Black joined the Robert E. Lee chapter of the Ku Klux Klan in Jefferson County. In 1925, Black decided to run for the United States Senate, and shortly after his announcement, he resigned from the Klan. After a year of informal campaigning, Black formally began his campaign in March 1926 on the steps of the Clay County Courthouse, where he often visited as a child. Part of his speech follows. Equality under the law to millionaire and pauper, factory owner and worker, is the test of a successful democracy. We must turn a deaf ear alike to the selfish appeals of those who attack property rights or human rights. It is my conception that the representatives of the great people in the age-old struggle between those who have and those who want is to hold the scales of justice evenly. Yes, Black said, the great goal of democracy is universal equity. The vision I see, he said, shines from justice to all and special favor to none. Black was elected to the United States Senate, relying on a new coalition of partisan interests that he called the dry Protestant progressive voters of the state. It was an unusual political combination. But Black's public record made his victory truly more remarkable. More than anyone else in Alabama's statewide politics since the end of populism, Hugo Black had built a public record in an all-white election that made him extremely vulnerable to accusations that he was far too friendly to what was then called Negro interests and an advocate even of social equality. In 1926, no other statewide candidate had represented a biracial labor union with African-American officers. None had clients whose black and white members had committed acts of violence during strikes. No other candidate in 1926 had represented the AFL-CIO at a time when it endorsed the right of all men to vote. No other person running for the U.S. Senate attempted to remove a city's police force and public officials because they mistreated and, and forced confessions from African-American suspects. And no one else represented African-Americans in court against white industrialists. None but Hugo Black had defended the constitutional rights of African-American convicts in Alabama's prison system. And no one else had stood, much less volunteered, in open court to defend organized lawlessness, to represent African-American convicts who rioted, dynamited, and destroyed millions of dollars of the white man's equipment. In the U.S. Senate, when he ser started serving in 1927, corporate interests were the animating concerns of Black's 11-year term. One of the first bills Senator Black introduced was a ban on public utility corporations from operating radio stations. And soon he proposed the public registration of all lobbyists in, in Washington, something that had never been done. Because he, as he argued, large corporations were using secret propaganda and fraudulent lobbies to hide their efforts to shape the government for their private profits. According to Black, at that time, President Herbert Hoover was attempting to place the federal government under the control of large corporations by appointing mostly corporate lawyers and corporate officials to run the federal government. 
Once, federal, once Franklin Roosevelt became president, Black became the South's most ardent supporter of the New Deal in the Senate, and he often wanted to go far faster and further than President Roosevelt was willing to go in reshaping the tax system to tax the wealthy and the corporate and to build a better economy for workers in America. When greed and privilege grasp unearned wealth and condemn millions to undeserved poverty and misery, Black said, government is useless if it does not curb greed and destroy privilege. During his Senate years, Black cleared the way for the passage of legislation that broke, broke apart some of the largest monopolies in the country and was the sponsor of the law that became the first national minimum wage for workers in America. In 1935, an anti-lynching bill reached the floor of the U.S. Senate and immediately caused a Southern filibuster. Every U.S. Senator from the South spoke in opposition against the anti-lynching bill, including Senator Black. I deny that this is an anti-lynching bill, Senator Black declared. Black argued that the language of the legislation would enable corporations such as mining companies to go into federal court and have local sheriffs prosecuted for not protecting the miners' property during a labor strike. Black insisted that this, the wording of this anti-lynching bill would be the strongest weapon which has ever been placed in the hands of the employing class of this country to destroy every association of working men when they attempted to protect their rights or protect their wages. Hiding behind a sentiment against lynching, Black argued, the proposed bill would crucify labor organizations which have existed in the United States of America. <clears throat> Unlike several Southern senators, Black did not attempt to justify the lynchings or to denigrate African Americans' conduct or character during his remarks on the floor. The bill failed to pass, and the filibuster ended. Two years later, President Roosevelt appointed Hugo Black to the United States Supreme Court, 1937. Less than four months after joining the court, Justice Black wrote a dissenting opinion in which he stated, I do not believe the word person in the 14th Amendment includes corporations. This amendment sought to prevent discrimination by the states against classes or races, not against corporations. Three years after his appointment, Black wrote a majority opinion for the court in which he held that the forced confessions by local police officers in America violated the federal constitution. Three African American men were forced to confess, confess and were sentenced to death. Black's opinion held for the first time that a forced confession by a local police officer in the United States was a violation of the United States Constitution. He wrote, under our constitutional system, courts stand against winds that blow as havens of refuge for those who might otherwise suffer because they are helpless, weak, outnumbered. Do you hear the echoes of the Bessemer grand jury report? Or because they are non-conforming victims of prejudice and public excitement. Due process of law preserved by all by our Constitution commands that no such practice as that disclosed by this record shall send any to his death. No higher duty, no more solemn responsibility rests upon this court than that of translating into living law and maintaining this constitutional shield deliberately planned and inscribed for the benefit of every human being. Do you hear the echoes of John Brown? Subject to our Constitution, of whatever race, creed, or persuasion. Over the following 30 years, Justice Black became a principal force on the United States Supreme Court for outlawing Southern segregation and for establishing an enforceable constitutional protection that, in effect, sought equal justice to all 
and special privilege to none. Hugo Black's journey across much of Alabama's landscape of Jim Crowism raises questions about his own motives and means. Why would someone who had such a unique public role in challenging the worst aspects of Jim Crow criminal justice in attempting to advance the interests of Alabama's only interracial organization, join the Ku Klux Klan. At the time, he was continuing to fight to end convict leasing in Alabama. By the way, I spend a chapter in my book exploring this question, which I think most biographers and historians have oversimplified. But as important and intriguing as that question is, I think there are other questions more important for us today that relate to how these forms of racial exploitation and violence emerged and sustained over time. While the Klan is today the, most, the nation's most recognizable cultural symbol of racial hatred and violence, during Alabama's worst period of Jim Crow injustice in the early 1900s, it was not the primary force that created and maintained the fee system that annually sent as many as 40% of all African-American males in Jefferson County to jails, prisons, mines, or even their death. Nor was the Klan the cause for creating and maintaining Alabama's convict leasing system which may have sent as many as 10,000 prisoners to their death during the first quarter of the century in Alabama, and surely maimed and deformed many thousands more, prisoners who were too often convicted for petty crimes or convicted on forced confessions. The fact is, there were no recorded lynchings in Jefferson County after the miners' strike of 1921 until 1934. Do we have the collective honesty? Do we have the capacity for a collective memory that recognizes that the Klan, as abhorrent as it may appear by historical and modern standards, may not have been white supremacy's worst, most damaging forms of violence in this period of Alabama history? Or, that some of the so-called best citizens of our state were in fact responsible for the worst of the Jim Crow racial violence. After all, it was the marriage of unbridled private profit with cheap and corrupt state and local government that enabled the racial violence of the fee system and the convict lease system that defined the bulk of the Jim Crow criminal justice or injustice system of Alabama in the first quarter of the 20th century. Then, and perhaps today, we should look more closely at what our government has done in Justice Black's words to help the helpless, weak, outnumbered, and the non-conforming victims of prejudice and public excitement in our society. Then, and perhaps today, we should look to see how private profit and devalued government are creating the systems of racial exploitation and resist the simple temptation to mistake the ugliest, most visible forms of racism and white supremacy as the most dangerous or the most harmful. The life and times of Hugo Black of Alabama is not a story about how a Klansman miraculously transformed himself into the champion of equal justice and into the enemy of a segregated South. Instead, it reveals the complexity that has existed throughout much of Alabama history about whether white society can honestly face its past with an adequate moral imagination that permits it to own the racial wrongs that have occurred and to reckon honestly with the obligations that such a history presents today. Hugo Black may have occasionally worn the Klan's white robes during his 22 months as a member, and he certainly made some very hazardous moral choices across his life. 
But his actions and his words from the days of Clay County to the halls of the Supreme Court building in Washington reveal a white Southerner, flawed in many respects, but deeply committed to a historical notion of equal justice to all in the criminal justice system and fearless in his passionate advocacy for economic justice across the nation. In this way, perhaps the arc of Hugo Black's life in Alabama may teach us an important lesson today on how, where, how and where people of goodwill, flawed as we are, should try to bend our society towards equal justice or what Black called the great goal of democracy, universal equity. Thank you for listening. We do have time for a few questions. We are recording today, so if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand and let me or Wesley pass a microphone to you um, before you ask your question. So did Hugo Black um, preside over the Gomillion versus Lightfoot case? and? Was he involved in that case? No, he did not preside over the case. He, he, was, uh, he was involved in the case. He, uh, he voted uh, uh, for overturning uh, the uh, gerrymandered uh, district in Tuskegee. Uh, he did not write the case, but he did join in the majority to overturn uh, the redistricting. The leasing of inmates, can you say that in a way in Alabama that's still going on today? Because I know what I read in the papers where they get paid like 10 cents an hour, which is ridiculous, and they've been to Supreme Court. Is it still really going on that we haven't gotten rid of that here? Well, I, th I think it's true that uh, several states uh, in the South and a few elsewhere uh, still do use uh, convict labor. Uh, and, and pay them uh, generally a symbolic amount of money. Uh, I think the, uh, the primary difference is that, uh, that they, uh, they're doing work that, uh, that does not commit them to death within seven years. Uh, and, uh, and also that the system is not now uh, entirely rigged for the purpose of racial exploitation. I mean, the fee system got folks paid public officials to, uh, to round up, as I said, almost yearly, almost 40% of the, the, the black males of Jefferson County, paid them for getting them into the system and moving them in, and then it fed the convict leasing system itself. Um, as um, as many good uh, legal services and uh, pro bono lawyers know, the problems of the criminal justice system in the South and Alabama remain, but uh, they don't resemble what was at work in, in, in that era of Jim Crowism. Thank God. Hi, um, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I take your point that maybe the Hugo Black's membership in the KKK uh, wasn't as bad as the convict leasing system and the government's dependency on it, or that he didn't vote for the anti-lynching bill um, for other reasons. But I worry that the kind of nuancing of this is obfuscates the kind of reality of how horrible and how just what an impact that had on other people in the South. Right. Well, I think, um, I think the nuance I'm trying to draw is one which uh, doesn't uh, explain away Black's membership. He, 
it was he didn't talk very much about it after he became a member of the court. I think in part because he thought it was the one case he couldn't win in the public domain. But I think uh, what's important is um, Well, let me put it this way. For white Southerners, what is important is do not dismiss Justice Black's life in Alabama and the work he did on that one point. Think everybody makes compromises, and I don't defend that compromise. I don't think Justice Black, Hugo Black joined the Klan for political reasons. I think it did benefit him some politically. Um, the analysis of voting returns in Alabama, as best you can do, shows that the, the biggest force he had was he was a member of the Baptist Church. That, that probably benefited him more than anything else. But white Alabamians need to understand that there is a history of resistance that they can be a part of today. And uh, there aren't many examples of people who were willing to stand in court and defend convicts. And we need that example for in this day when, when folks see themselves and see their models of behavior, uh, oftentimes uh, according to who looks like them. The second point, though, I think is that we really do have to understand how much class mattered in, in this state and perhaps still does. And that uh, while uh, we can look at the Klan, the Klan actually, according to, to the, the best scholarship in the 20s, and was really a middle class movement, sort of like the, the White Citizens Council of the 50s. Uh, we can, we can, if we dismiss, uh, if we focus on racial problems, the problems of racism and race relations, on uh, and use the Klan as the the worst symbol of what can happen. What we do is we let a lot of a lot of other things go by that have to have our attention if we're going to to have equal justice for all and special privilege to none. And uh, I, think, uh, I think no one in this room, no person of goodwill wants the Klan to, to be a, f a force or even to exist, I would assume. But if we continue to use that as the ultimate measure of what is problem with this society, then we will not get where I want us to be in terms of equal justice for all. So those are the two points, the reason I was trying to make that nuance. Uh, thank you for the uh, speech and the, uh, because I'm originally from New York. In New York, we have unions. And in the unions, everyone is paid equally, no matter who you are. My question is, I never heard of the right to work law until I came to Alabama. Do we have that law because of what happened with the UAW, or do we have that law because it really discriminates? By that I mean uh, most people do not get paid more than seven twenty-five an hour. I just like to know why. Well, uh, the right to work was sustained by the Supreme Court, um, uh, was passed by the Congress and sustained by the Supreme Court uh, with Hugo Black in dissent. Um, it was the uh, the during, uh, after the New Deal and after the collapse of, of Harry Truman's Fair Deal, uh, Northern uh, Republicans and Southern Democrats uh, joined forces to, to strip uh, the previous law, federal laws of uh, protections for many of the unions, many of the protections for unions. And, uh, and, and allowed uh, states to uh, pass right-to-work laws. And Southern, Southerners, shortly after 1948, uh, moved quickly to do so. And, uh, and Mississippi leading the way, uh, Governor White of Mississippi led the way in then trying to, um, to appeal to businesses to move to Mississippi. Uh, other Southern governors joined him. Uh, on the basis of cheap labor rather than the quality of the worker. 
And there lies the origins of the right to work law that Alabama has. Um, where, excuse me, where is Clay County? Clay County? Uh, it's uh, east, a little, little uh, south of here and mostly east of here. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, if you, go, you know where Anniston, Alabama is? If you go south from Anniston, Alabama, if you go out I-20 and get to Anniston and you would go south, you'd go to, uh, to Clay County. It sits between Talladega and uh, Randolph counties if you're... No, oh, no, no. That's that's my county. That's uh, that's up above Birmingham. <coughs> well, um, maybe maybe next time we'll put a map of a county map of Alabama. But um, the Free State is uh, was up in um, up above Jasper, uh, north of, of Birmingham, and. in Birmingham that cost him quite a career because he would not go along. He said, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and I won't do what I've been required to do. He died penniless. Yeah. And um, again, well, he was at Hartzell in North Alabama up in that area. Well, during that 1921 uh, miners' strike, uh, Robert Steiner, who was a, a lawyer here in Montgomery, was also commander of the, the state troops. And um, he, when he made the order to uh, arrest any, uh, any two miners uh, who uh, stopped together on sidewalks or streets, um, an uh, African-American preacher in uh, Walker County uh, confronted a soldier on the incident and said, uh, uh, we, have, we have constitutional rights, our lawyers tell us. And the soldier said, damn the Constitution, I followed General Steiner. And um, I think that's pretty well the way it was uh, in Birmingham uh, in some respects as well, outside the strike. We have time for one more question. Okay. Your comments about uh, the history of alcoholism in Justice Black's family and his support for prohibition made me think of the work of the Harvard historian Lisa McGear. Mm. She, in her book, she argued that the Klan was often used as unofficial deputies in, the, in, in prohibition to bust up stills, to arrest people who, or harass people who were participating in the commerce of alcohol. Do you think his participation in the Klan was because of his support for prohibition? I think he, uh, he certainly found people who shared his view when he was in the Klan. Um, the, and, and, you know, that, that if you look at that uh, self-described coalition of his that helped him win the 1926 election, dry, Protestant, progressive voters of Alabama. Those first two are probably uh, largely defined much of that Klan membership, the dry Protestants. Um, I, I'll give you, uh, I should say that if I were pressed to give, um, I, I don't think he joined the Klan for any one specific reason. But if I were to give a, uh, say which re reason was probably more powerful, I would say it was because he knew that he wanted, he wanted, black joined lots of organizations because he wanted those white men who were going to sit on the juries to know him, to like him, to trust him. And in 1923, uh, he was still litigating lots of cases lots of injuries from white and black workers, and he wanted those folks who were going to sit on the jury to know that he was represent who he was, that he was a good guy, and that they should listen to his arguments. If I were to give one major reason, that would be it. And I think that relates to uh, the very point, which is that um, the folks who paid their poll taxes 
and got on juries were often members of the Klan. You didn't really, you know, the, 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 there's lots of trials where the issue comes up, was this a Klan-shaped decision? The truth is, I think if we could ever figure out how to, how to do it uh, quantitatively, I think we could probably find that many of the members, uh, the white men who were on the juries, were Klansmen. Not because they were there for any other reason, except the fact is the Klan promoted their members to get involved in citizenship, and that meant paying your poll taxes and getting out there and being, being a voice, uh, whether you had your regalia on or not. It's a, it's a part of our history, I think, that, um, uh, that is, is, is confusing and complex. And I think today what I've tried to suggest to you is that those of you who are white Alabamians, there is, a, there is an example of a, com a lifelong commitment to making Alabama a better place through equal justice for all, special privilege to none. And to those all Alabamians, what I've tried to say today is we have a history we cannot escape, and it is our obligation to reckon with it as complex as it may be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. There are copies of Mr. Suit's book available in the lobby. Have a great afternoon.